Production funding for Rare Visions and Roadside Revelations has been provided in part by Sprint, committed to the community, connecting you to the world. Welcome to a show about things you can see without going far and a lot of them are free. If you thought there was nothing in the old heartland, you ought to hit the black op with these fools in a van. Look out, they're driving hard, checking out art in their own backyard. Randy does the steering so he won't hurl. Mike got the map, such a man of the world. That's done with the camera, kinda heavy on his shoulder. And that giant ball of tape, it's a world record holder. Look out, they're driving hard, checking out art in their own backyard. Look out, they're driving hard, checking out the world in their own backyard. Checking out the world in their own backyard. One final shake goodbye before I go. Dear TV Mailbag, could you leave this behind? Hi, Don the Camera Guy here, bidding fond farewell to my Nicole. Let's go, let's go. More or less ready, I guess, to take my seat in the back of the van so that these TV weasels can show you more great grassroots art and off the beaten path attractions. Well, we're going a long, long ways. We are? Did you lock the front door? You didn't tell me we were going a long way. <laughs> if we told you everything that was going to happen, you wouldn't go. Now, as it turns out, taking the road less traveled actually begins with one that's pretty busy. That would be I-70 heading west, getting off at the Fort Riley exit. Lured, I suspect, by the promise of a prominently placed but purely platonic atomic cannon. That's it right there, right over your left, your left shoulder? No, 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 no. That's not it? No, it's clear up there. Why don't you run up and get a shot? You're doing really good, Don. But that's not the atomic cannon. It's clear up there. Yeah, that's the atomic cannon. Oh, there it is. Does that look atomic to you? He's going to the top. Oh, what a stud. Oh. Yeah, it would be Pedro right there. Look out, Abilene. Look at that. What a beaut. Probably a great place to bring chicks, don't you think? Yeah. Don, be, be careful now. There's a hill there. <laughs> Randy warned me about all the sex and violence in this show. And in like, fact, on the way down, in between Pratt Falls, oh, like the boys were getting all worked up about lingerie <laughs> in Junction City. Make that historical lingerie modeled with plenty of joie de vivre by some vivacious volunteers. Bring it on. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's good. Yeah. An 18 inch waist was the desired and admired size of the day. And the drawers covered the legs <laughs> to well below the knees. I, I'm sweating up my glasses. <laughs> now to get the whole undercover story, you have to let them know in advance. But the deal includes a meal and one crazed doughboy. What do you mean, Chief Paul? He'll kiss his teeth. What more could you ask for? And having asked for it, we once again resume the driving portion of our show. And we are driving north, almost to Nebraska, where something in Belleville has been guaranteed to ring our chimes. Since 1996, the Boyer Gallery has been home to a jaw-dropping collection of meticulously made mechanical marvels. Made by one Paul Boyer, mostly for display in every summer at the North Central Kansas Fair. The fair is one week out of the year, and that was the only time people could see his art. And this way they can see it at any time, and we're about half and half, things that have been the fair and things that have never been there. He has a notebook full of things that he could, he could build for 20 years and never build everything that he's planned. 
I tell people he's like a songwriter. Everything inspires a new display and, and he starts building it. When he was 10 years old, he went to our local carnival and a man set up a tent and he carved wooden characters and made them into puppets. And he said he spent every cent he had that year watching the man carve. He was back the next year and he watched him again. He said, if that guy can do it, I can. And that's where he got started. He was disabled in 1965. He was struck by a drunk driver while he was clearing snow on a garden patcher and it crushed his leg. He ended up losing the lower part of his leg and he got hepatitis in the blood. He's maintained his sense of humor through everything that's happened in his life. And when he, when he really feels good, he gets ornery and the characters get ornerier. What these are are electric motors out of the timers on clothes dryers. We had an appliance dealer that knew Paul built things and wanted to help him out. So every time somebody would bring in a dryer, he'd junk it out and save the timer motor. And he uses a series of cogs and gears. And this, like I said, has six different motors underneath it. This is his mega hen. Now, this hen lays eggs with such force that she can bounce them off the board into a basket. That's that would be prize won. winning in my book. This will be prize winning if it works, and it should. <laughs> <laughs> he told me last Sunday if he were a smarter man, he'd made the basket bigger because she has to be pretty accurate. Ooh. These goats do co make contact and, and make qu quite a noise, so they have bumped heads really hard lots of times. This display has probably run 500 hours. These are the three Gerties. He calls his ex exercise lady Gertie. I don't know why, but uh, he's been making Gerties for quite a while. That is his self-portrait. He made that when he was in his early 60s. He has on magnifying glasses. He chews on a pipe, doesn't smoke it anymore. Uh, he put on his artificial leg for his self-portrait. And you notice he's carving one of those great big noses that he loves. He told a group of 4-H kids one night that he always carves the noses first so he has something to hang on to while he finishes the rest. Do you find kids just fat, standing here agog? We do not charge for children that are under six. And many times it's the child under six that is most fascinated because they like all the movement and they'll just stand here hypnotized. He likes, he draws it all out. You know, you look at these things and you think he just started putting things together. But he didn't. He draws it all out. And then as he works on it, if he has trouble, he draws little cartoon characters in the blueprints, giving him trouble. So when he's done, you can see everywhere this has been a problem. He is a perfectionist and he's very persistent and he will work till he gets it to work right or no one will see it. <laughs> he made these as a challenge to himself and then to entertain people. And people ask him, what will you take for them? And he said, they're, they're not for sale. There's no price. So don't even ask about buying one. That's not what this place is about, though being interactive, it does help if you bring a few basic skills. When you push the button, you've got to hold it three to five seconds. If you're not sure how to do that, you count 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, and if it's not too hard, you go 1,004, 1,005. Do you need some fingers to help you with that? Paul's making new things all the time, so by our next visit, there's bound to be plenty more buttons to push. But we're done for now, and this part of the state is starting to look very familiar. In fact, without Cocker City and its big ball of twine, there'd be no big ball of tape. Reason enough to stop and play a little catch right in the middle of Highway 24. Well, and it always just reminds me how far we have to go. Yeah. So do you suppose we're violating any major ordinances in Cocker City yet? When did that ever stop us? Now small towns being what they are, who should pass by in the midst of our frolic but the grandson of the Twinemeister himself, Frank Stover. Just come through and see these three. <laughs> the thought, what is that black thing in front of the ball of twine? Well, that's, that's the world's largest ball of videotape. <laughs> that's good. I'm, that's I'm right. shocked you didn't recognize I it. I really like that my granddad's put it together. But there was that other little issue of the one from another place, right? Yeah. He, he was unhappy about I that, I understand. I don't think we talk about that much anymore, though. No, oh, yeah. no this has got to be the biggest now. <laughs> yeah. Because it is. <laughs> Get that out of here. <laughs> Goodbye. He appears to mean it, and for once, these producers were able to take a hint. So I believe we're done for the day, though I know there'll be more mayhem tomorrow.
Looks like what? another day, another chance for a gratuitous shower scene. Okay, you guys want me to come back when you're through with your meeting? <laughs> yeah. Though this is perhaps a first for Lucas, a sleepy little town we like to call the visionary art capital of the universe. Where's your damn water tower? It's nice and compact, too. Our self-serve motel is just two blocks away from a place we've been before, but don't mind going again because the Garden of Eden is just about as good as it gets. Built back around the turn of the century by S.P. Dinsmore, a Civil War veteran, populist party proponent, and showman extraordinaire. He was 63 when he started the house. And so when he was really rolling on the sculpture, he was in his 70s. And I think he would have kept going, but he went blind. And you can tell by the way he worked, uh, he was getting better and better as he went. Did it make him happy? Did he loved the place. He, he loved the fact that people were then coming here to find out about his beliefs. One of the ideas of the populace is that you didn't beat on people, you know, this is what you had to believe. They, they thought that you could convert people to their way of th uh, thinking if you entertained them, if little, you made it funny. A little humor. Yeah, and so he was always doing little stunts and doing humorous things. And in these sculptures, there's a lot of humor until you get to Labor Crucified, which is not very funny at all. Labor Crucified by lawyers and bankers and preachers and doctors, but most of the pieces really do have a touch of humor in them. And concrete was, was kind of space age material, right? In the early it was. Uh, there was a, a big movement to build with concrete because everybody wanted to make things that would last forever. That was, a big, that was a big buzzword at the time, last forever. Uh, and this is a summation of his life. This is a summation of his beliefs. So it's charged, very charged sculpture. This was built during the Re Russian Revolution and he said, look, people want to be free. They want the right to determine their own life. And in, the, and in Russia right now, they're using the bullet. I believe that we can use the ballot. He really believed in the American way of life. And that's why he has a really great concrete crosscut saw marked ballot. Over here is the devil throwing, getting ready to throw a pitchfork. And he said, why is it that the devil's always after the little kids? He said, if I were God, I wouldn't let the devil do this. And there's, see, there's a concrete hand up there that's stopping the devil from throwing his pitchfork at the little kid. Think about a town in the 1900s. There's kerosene lights. There's this sort of yellow golden glow coming out of some houses, and that's about it. There's no street lights. He would fire up his generator and this thing would light up. The devil had always had a red light bulb in it. Uh, so the devil was, eyes were glowing red. Uh, it must have been an incredible thing. It, was, it just attracted people like moths. At least one major thing has changed since our last visit. The garden's mortgage is now paid off and this once endangered site is no longer at risk. Though Dinsmore's actual remains, still in tomb for public viewing, unless you're a camera guy, are fast going the way of all earthly things. There are some people who just come to see the body, you know, which baffles me, but once some of the sculptures explain to them, it starts really clicking, they start understanding what's going on, and they, they think it's just incredible. You know, I think they're all at some level affected by the sculptural quality. This is a premier piece of artwork. This is, I mean, forget grassroots. This is a really great piece of art. It's also been a source of inspiration for others who create, including the late Florence Diebel, an English teacher who lived down the street and loved rocks. Florence built a mini Mount Rushmore and replicas of rocks and mountains that she enjoyed. While briefly trespassing back here, the boys did do some pausing and reflecting on Florence's 99 years. Then decided they'd actually do a little something to help, though little pretty much sums it up. There's a weed there, there's a weed right there. I can't get that. This is, okay. No, weed? that's flower, plant. Okay. As we've come to find out, we think this type of artwork increases their lifespan. Uh, because they have a purpose to get up in the morning. So you want to get out of your house coat and get your clothes on and because somebody might show up at the door. And uh, then you've always got one more piece to work on, you know, and so we think it uh, really helps people live longer.
Nine out of ten doctors agree grassroots art leads to longer, <laughs> healthier, more productive lives. Longevity. Longevity. Now Roslyn is our kind of curator. What she doesn't already know, she tries to find out, and what she can't find out, we suspect she makes up. Plus, they carry our tapes right there at the front of the Grassroots Art Center, which has grown by leaps and bounds. It's still got all of Inez Marshall's great limestone sculptures carved down the road in Portis and plenty of Ed Root's concrete and kitchenware pieces rescued from the family farm that now sits under Wilson Lake. But she's also snagged some of the psychedelic bathroom Luray's Leroy Wilson painted and painted and painted again down in his basement. And some sizable samples of M.T. Liggett's Feel Those Signs in Mullenville. Perhaps sweetest of all, there's the full-size motorcycle that Herman Divers built with pull tabs in Topeka. A common theme among the folk making this particular kind of folk art is that they often didn't start till late in life. Take Cocker City's Warren Litt, a newspaper man turned totem polar. This is what I think gives us all hope that if at 84 you can start in creating an environment and three years later you have your whole yard full of totem poles and cottonwood crotch people. Any of us, you know, 87, he's just getting going in high gear. Then there's Earl Slagle, a self-professed tinkerer who does the bulk of his tinkering around Manhattan. So does this represent uh, the, the molecular mass of biatomic atoms? And the... No, that represents that I build a machine that would make circles. Earl has painted his trees orange, affixed unusual foliage to them, and even sculpted his own evening silhouette, more commonly known to the neighbors as the Scud Launcher. But you have never actually launched any weapons? No, from your... I've threatened a neighbor's dog with it a few times. <laughs> It'll probably take me two days if I've got two figures. And but there's Lawrence Reynolds, whose janitor's job at Fort Hayes State puts him in perfect position to pick up scraps from the art department, which he paints and welds and carves into pieces on display here as well. Th this is every man's problem. It's called getting your attention. It's a barber shop, and you got two guys reading the paper. But if you look at their faces, they look it under the lady's dress, and he's concentrating so hard looking that he cut the hair off and got a ball spot in the back of the guy's head. And most of these have a, a religious theme or something that, that really happened, like this one here, Dancing on Your Grave. Well, I see this one down here. Yeah, this is, uh, just screwing with your mind. <laughs> is that a Phillips head? <laughs> <laughs> no doubt about it, there's more and more art here all the time. But Roslyn says much of the credit must go to her clientele the people who come and get excited enough to stay no on the lookout for more. There's no hiding in TV, come on now. Visitors who come to the Art Center tell us about new environments in their community. So we get to go investigate it, and there's another unique Kansan sitting there doing something. Those words would also seem to apply to the lady known around here simply as Vera. Her tavern in Hunter, about 25 miles away, is the only sign of life there after dark. But you realize pretty quickly it's not the beer or the bar that makes this place special. It's the proprietor and her willingness to break into the one song she knows with fervor. On the wings of the snow white dove, he sends it pure sweet love, the sign from above. On the wings of a dove, when trouble surround us, when evil will come, the body grows weak, body grows weak, the spirits grows numb, spirits grows numb. When these things he said us, he doesn't forget us. He sinned on his love, he sinned on his love, on the wings of a dove, on the wings of the snow. Now you see why the lady is a legend, and once you've seen it, you're supposed to attest to it by signing the ceiling, which I think the boys are doing, though if you were expecting pithy brilliance, I'd suggest you guess again. <laughs> 
At some point, fish and fowl must have caused some serious problems here, but that's a stink we can't be blamed for. And quick as the winks I barely got, we're back on US 36. Recklessly passing large vehicles, I guess, so we can get to Norton while the banks are still open. To one in particular, the First State Bank, because if I've got this right, it is also a hallowed hall to losers, or at least those fine Americans who've run for president and failed. The idea was Bill Rouse, W.W. W. Rouse. He not only ran the bank, but uh, he designed this building. It was an old theater, and so he had it remodeled in the mid-60s, and the bank moved into this, and he put the also ran gallery in then. I'm a loser. So there'd be uh, Humphrey. Humphrey. There'd be... Gerald Ford was a loser. Dukakis. Um, Carter. Charles Evans Hughes. He was defeated by Woodrow Wilson. So do you have a favorite also ran when you look through here? Not really. Horace Greeley was, was an also ran? Horace had kind of some wild hair growth there, didn't he? Yes, that he did. That probably bizarre. cost him the election. I'm a loser. Oh, oh, there he is. Oh. You're hoping they'll stop maybe open an account, but if they don't, it's okay? It's okay. Is that Mr. Rogers? Randy, what shade of lipstick is he wearing there? There's a lot of people that have lost and yet oh. either became presidents or something and really made a name for themselves, and then there's others you know, we've forgotten who they were. And then there's Bob Dole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now Bob's hometown is close enough you'd have thought he might drop by. But apparently that Viagra is keeping him otherwise occupied. At this point, I also ran out of fresh material, so like that mutton-chopped loser Horace Greeley once said, go west. Hello, Miss Douglas. And thanks again to I-70, that's what we're doing, all the way to the border and beyond. Now back in the days when US-24 passed right by it, the Wonder Tower here outside Genoa was a real roadside attraction. These days, it's just difficult enough to get here to keep the teeming crowds at bay. Now, I suppose this is the highest spot between someplace and someplace. Watch out for those antlers. They are open. It's only a dollar to get in here. Yeah, here. No, no, I don't want that. No, 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 only a dollar. It seems too yeah. cheap. Right off the bat, Jerry, I can tell you by looking at this place, that's not enough okay. money. You're not asking. Give him, give him more than a dollar. But now we get that back if we yeah. guess ten, ten in a row. Of those. Uh -huh. Ten in a row. But now you're gonna have to buy supper. Okay, this is the first one. Now what's that used for a long time ago? Sifting well, rock. That's, that's a good guess. Another man, he tried to tell me, I see a saying now, he said, keep the hail off your head. Just down here and let her hail. <laughs> we didn't get it. We didn't get it. There's still 299 to go yet, so okay. <laughs> one lady told me it had to be to pierce your ear. Yes, yeah, I'm thinking it has something to do with skin. Now, you let a cherry right on there. Take some pits uh, out. Oh, it's a cherry pitter. Cherry, cherry pitter. pitter. You put the cherry right there. And this place is quite a pit stop, isn't it? Yes. Uh -huh. I yeah, give up that, on that one. I'm sorry. It's a cow pill. That's nose related, clearly. Yeah, clearly wrong on that. No, it is. It's, it's a camel it's, nose ring. Ice cream. Yeah. Ice yeah. cream. Ice cream. Alamodi. It's an old fashioned right. ice cream. Alamodi. Scoop. You got it. That's uh, right. That's no, I didn't get it at all. You I got it. That's the problem. That's why you have all the dollars. I've been here 33 years. But Charlie Gregory is a man that took and built it originally. And he come here first, 1879. And then uh, he built eight rooms out of rock. And his sign read, eat, drink, gas, and pop with the tire. That's what he signed read one time. He had 12 people working here. They some groceries, eat, dancing, and everything. Right, there's even open day and night. If you guys looked at the rock in this place, look at the ceilings. This whole, this is like a rare vision in itself. Look, there's seashells in it. Uh -huh. But each room's a little different? Yeah, oh yeah, each room just a little different, right, uh-huh. Oh! oh. There's so much great stuff in this place. Thank you. Just You're gonna need a bigger camera just to shoot it all. <laughs> it, it's a uh, missing link. They're still looking for this one. <laughs> oh, that's right, I took my hand, that really hurts. <laughs> there was an old dinosaur headed south and that come out of the north end. <laughs> I know, dude. <laughs>
Now, as to that tower, there are quite a few steps, and the way up is pretty narrow, but once you get to the top, it opens up, and you've got a great view of, well, nothing in particular, but those six states that the boys are still arguing South, about. South Dakota. South Dakota, Nebraska. Nebraska. That's it. I've always wanted to see this place since I was a kid. Dad, if you're watching this, you should have stopped, because this was cool. And knowing these cheap producers, someday we'll be back, if only to reclaim that dollar. I think he's gloating. I think that's enough wonder for now. This is Dom the Camera Guy, signing off. Okay, you can do like very, you don't have to, uh oh, choo choo, ready, doo, buddy, boo, 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 boo. I can empty yodel, yodel, who did you, yodel, who did you, how you like them apples, say whatever. World's largest ball of tape. John, you've never had the, the honor, have you? Of what? Oh, oh. the cars are coming. Oh. It's hot, I think. Oh, oh. oh man. Hey, here, you hold it. No, no, no. <laughs> we, 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 run, run. <laughs> Do that again. Don't fall for that trip. Do not fall for that trip. <laughs> 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 oh my, that was great. <laughs> Could you do that again? To learn more about the sights you've seen on this program, you can order the companion book to the series Rare Visions and Roadside Revelations by calling the number on your screen. Production funding for Rare Visions and Roadside Revelations has been provided in part by Sprint, committed to the community, connecting you to the world.